From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. A jury finds former Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman not guilty of lying to the FBI as President Biden announces that he will provide missile systems to Ukraine. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We're joined today by my colleagues, columnist Kim Strassel and editorial writer Mene Ukwe-Barua. The public record shows that Michael Sussman approached the FBI in 2016 with some apparently junk internet data that claimed to prove a secret connection between Donald Trump and a Russian bank. But the legal dispute is whether Sussman deceived the FBI by presenting this information as a tip from a concerned citizen when he was actually working for the Clinton campaign. Special Counsel John Durham charged him with lying to the FBI, but on Tuesday, after six hours of deliberation, a jury in the District of Columbia found Sussman not guilty, and here he is reacting to the verdict outside the courthouse. I told the truth to the FBI, and the jury clearly recognized that with their unanimous verdict today. I'm grateful to the members of the jury for their careful and thoughtful service. Despite being falsely accused, I'm relieved that justice ultimately prevailed in my case. As you can imagine, this has been a difficult year for my family and me. But right now, we are just grateful for the love and support of so many during this ordeal. And I'm looking forward to getting back to the work that I love. Kim, you followed this story closely from the start. What do you make of this not guilty verdict? Um, so a lot of people are presenting this as a blow to John Durham, etc. I guess it depends on what you thought John Durham's goal of this trial was. And no doubt he wanted a guilty verdict. Prosecutors don't bring cases without reason for the most part. And yeah, he's certainly disappointed. But if the other reason for doing this was to finally tell the story of what had happened with this particular aspect of the Clinton campaign's dirty trick in 2016, we got a lot of the information. And in that regard, he did the public a huge service. I think the problem here in terms of getting a guilty verdict, and there are a couple of different things we can talk about One of them is that this was a D.C. jury. (laughs) D.C. is notoriously left-leaning. I think it went 94 percent for Hillary Clinton in the 2016 election. So this was always going to be a tough row, especially because you only need one of those jurors, given that these are criminal charges, to disagree and get an acquittal in the end. I think that that's probably the main takeaway. The, The next question is the problems with the case at that Durham brought was just that the FBI, in order to really make this stick, you had to suggest the FBI had been duped by Michael Sussman. And the, one of the problems is that the long record here shows that the FBI seemed to be pretty aware, actually, that Sussman was working for a long time as a DNC and Clinton lawyer and should have treated this information a lot more skeptically, instead closed its eyes and moved ahead, potentially and likely because this was a very politicized case and it was engaging in politics itself. As a result, you had to convince the jury that the FBI just truly had no idea that this guy was working on behalf of a political campaign and would have taken different actions had they known. The defense did a pretty good job of showing that was not necessarily the case. And so you can look at the evidence. It seems pretty clear that he wasn't up front with them. But John Durham's tough job was to show that the lie that was told was material enough to have affected the FBI's decision. And in that regard, I think that was a much harder case to prove. We don't know exactly what went on in the jury room, of course, and we won't know unless some of these jurors decide that they want to speak out. But here's a couple sentences I'll read from a CNN report. It says one juror told CNN that the jury didn't initially agree on a verdict when they got the case on Friday afternoon. But over the course of deliberations, all 12 jurors agreed that Durham's team did not meet the five legal requirements needed to find Sussman guilty. One of those legal requirements is this materiality element, as Kim describes. And remember, in a criminal trial, you have to prove these things beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a very high standard of proof. Another thing I would point to is the defense tried to suggest that maybe there were some mixed motives. 
So they acknowledge that when Sussman was trying to get the media to write about this Internet data, he was working at that time for the Clinton campaign. But then they said that when he decided to take this to the FBI, he wasn't. He was only doing that as a concerned citizen. Apparently, when he took that taxi ride to the FBI for this meeting, he billed that. He expensed that to his firm, not to the Clinton campaign. And so, Manet, I mean, it's hard to know exactly what the jurors were thinking. But if this is correct, that there were five legal requirements in order to find Sussman guilty, it could have been any one juror, any one of those. Right. I think you're right to highlight the high bar uh, for convicting someone of lying to the FBI, they have to find that the individual um, sort of had a motive to do so and also sort of was very explicit in crossing certain boundaries in the testimony that they gave to the FBI in a way that makes it such that the crime that Sussman was being tried for might differ from what sort of a lay person would consider to be lying uh, if you just sort of presented the evidence to them. So in this particular case, we have James Baker, the FBI general counsel who Sussman spoke to, say that he 100 percent believes that Sussman denied having any direct connection to the campaign or acting on its behalf. There are also written notes, not from Baker, but from associates who he spoke to sort of debriefing his conversation with Sussman that record the same. And so that usually would be a pretty high bar of evidence when you have these contemporaneous accounts basically saying that Sussman said that he was not acting on behalf of the campaign. But again, the jurors have seen much more evidence than we have. We don't know exactly what they took into consideration. But to the point that you made, Kim, about whether this is a blow to the broader story that Durham is trying to tell, I mean, it strikes me whether or not Sussman lied to the FBI and whether or not that can be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. That strikes me as a little bit tangential to the report that we think that Durham will eventually write that will tell the story of how all of this investigation into President Trump came together. Yeah, let's just step back to 30,000 feet here. The reason this trial was monumentally important is it told one of two pieces of what was the Clinton dirty trick in 2016. We had found out in the fall of 2017 about the Clinton campaign's involvement with the infamous Steele dossier, which was fed to the FBI and which ultimately resulted in a FISA court, a secret court, actually listening in on an aide to the Trump campaign, Carter Page. We ultimately had an inspector general report out of the Department of Justice about how that was mishandled, how bad that was. We learned a lot from that. This second piece was about a second set of allegations that the Clinton campaign also fed to the FBI, even as they were uh, at the same time feeding to the media. It had to do with Alpha Bank, a Russian bank, claiming that there was some secret connection between that bank and a Trump server here in the United States. Those stories and allegations actually surfaced in the media at the end of October of 2016, as the Durham team showed in court and made the case in court. It was the the kind of quintessential October surprise dropped just a few days before the election, this slanderous accusation that Trump had secret ties to Russia. And we didn't know any of this, really. The outlines of how it was put together, the players who were involved, this tech executive named Rodney Joffe, who was involved in looking at non-proprietary data in order to come up with these so-called white papers that Sussman fed to the FBI, in which Fusion GPS and the Clinton campaign fed to the media. All of that came out as a result of Durham's indictment and follow-on court filings and the trial itself. So this was huge. And more importantly, we're going to get the second piece of this in the fall when Durham holds a second trial, this one against Igor Danchenko, who was one of the main sources for the dossier. So if you look at it that way, it's really notable to me that there are two trials that Durham has stood up and they, in essence, address the two dirty tricks the Clinton campaign affected during the 2016 campaign. That seems to me not insignificant and that looks as though his bigger goal here is to get the true story of what happened out there using these cases. And there is information that can be pulled into the public domain by this kind of trial regardless of the verdict. So we'll have to see what the 
Danchenko trial brings. But the one piece that I think is interesting that we might not have learned without the Sussman trial came from the testimony of Clinton's campaign manager in 2016, Robbie Mook. And he said that top advisors to Clinton did not have the expertise to vet this internet data, yet they decided anyway to try to push it out into the press. And Mrs. Clinton apparently approved of that plan and knew about it. So, Manet, that's something that we didn't know before, that we now know uh, thanks to his testimony in this Sussman trial. That's right. I mean, it's one of the oldest tricks in the book. As a campaign, obviously, you're doing a lot of opposition research. The Clinton campaign certainly was retaining Fusion GPS and other outfits trying to gather as much dirt as they possibly could on Trump. They get this lead about the Russian server. And as Mook said, they are not able to properly vet it. They can't really confirm whether it's valid or not. And so they decide they want to leak it to the press. I believe it was Slate that first published uh, some additional reporting based on this lead that we don't know if it came directly to them from the Clinton campaign, but certainly was put out by the Clinton campaign. And they're hoping that journalists are going to pick up the work and try to substantiate these leads, even if they themselves, that being the campaign, aren't able to do so. And so... Yeah, the, on the specific narrow question of whether Sussman lied to the FBI, sort of the jury's declined to convict him for that. But still, kind of Durham's broader goal of exposing some of the goings on between the two campaigns in 2016 is being fulfilled through these trials because it's unthinkable to think that Robbie Mook would have come out and admitted that Hillary Clinton had participated in this opposition research planting, if not for the fact that he was called to appear in court and testify on the matter. Hang tight. We'll be right back. You're listening to Potomac Watch from The Wall Street Journal. From the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. On Monday, President Biden was asked whether he would send long range missiles to Ukraine, and he said, quote, we're not going to send Ukraine rocket systems that strike into Russia. Unquote. And this is what we discussed at length on yesterday's podcast. And shortly thereafter, he ran an op-ed in the New York Times. He said, we have moved to quickly send Ukraine a significant amount of weaponry and ammunition so it can fight on the battlefield and be in the strongest possible position at the negotiating table. That's why I've decided that we will provide the Ukrainians with more advanced rocket systems and munitions that will enable them to more precisely strike key targets on the battlefield in Ukraine, unquote. And some of the news headlines are calling this a reversal in Biden's position. Some of them aren't. I've been trying to square this circle. And one possible answer is that Biden was waiting on some assurances that Ukraine would not use these weapons to strike targets inside Russia. And here's what Secretary of State Antony Blinken said this morning at a joint press conference with the NATO Secretary General. The Ukrainians have given us assurances that uh, they will not use these systems against targets on Russian territory. Uh, there is a strong trust bond between Ukraine and the United States, as well as with uh, our allies and partners. I'd also uh, say that throughout this um, aggression, indeed even before, President Biden was very clear with President Putin about what the United States would do if Russia proceeded with its aggression, uh, including continuing to provide security assistance that Ukraine needs to defend itself against the Russian aggression. Uh, there was no, no hiding the ball. We've been extremely clear about this from day one. Kim, what do you make of this? First, I guess the president's statement that he wasn't going to send these long-range missiles and then his statement that he was going to send these missiles. I think this is yet again another example of every time Joe Biden opens his mouth, he confuses things and gets stuff wrong. By the way, a very dangerous thing, especially when you're talking about matters of war and international conflict. But what really seems to be going on here is that the United States had made the decision that we were going to send rocket systems, rocket launchers to Ukraine that enables Ukraine to engage in far more precision targeting of the Russian military. The question or the debate was about what kind of munitions we would send along with that, the rockets that would be fired from those rocket launchers. There are ones that we make that have incredibly long range. They can go up to almost 
190 miles away. Those are apparently not the ones we are sending. We are sending shorter range munitions that have ranges more of like 20 to 45 miles. We don't know exactly, and it may not be clear for some time exactly which ones are going for strategic and sensitive reasons, obviously. But, you know, the worry here seems to have been that, as Blinken was alluding to, there's a great sensitivity in the United States among the Biden government that if Ukraine were to begin using these missiles to attack Russia on Russian territory, by the way, probably legitimately so, going after munitions depots and the bases that fire rockets within, into Ukraine. But nonetheless, if they did that with missiles that have been supplied by the United States, that it would embolden or allow Putin to again make the claim that the United States and NATO just want to use Ukraine as a base for a NATO attack into Russia and then use that as an excuse to mobilize a larger attack against Ukraine or an attack against NATO. So it appears that the negotiations seem to be a little bit more over the types of rockets that were going to be there and how Ukraine would use them. But Biden managed through his words simply to make a, a giant hash of it yet again. Well, Kim's explanation was the other one that came to mind. So there's some news reporting that the U.S. is going to send missiles now that have a range of about 50 miles. And apparently the U.S. has other systems that have a much longer range, something more like, you know, 190 miles, 200 miles. And so, Manet, maybe that's as simple as it gets is Biden was saying, we're not going to send the ones that can go 200 miles across Russian territory. We will only send these shorter range ones. But at the very least, it strikes me as a lack of clarity from the president of the United States muddying his message somewhat in these off-the-cuff remarks, which we've seen time and time again from President Biden. Right. I mean, we'll never know exactly whether it was a reversal of policy or whether it was merely Biden misstating what the agreement had already been. It certainly makes sense for him to get assurance from the Ukrainian government about how these systems are going to be used before he gives final authorization to send them over. But it certainly isn't helpful either to Ukraine or to the Biden administration's own reputation to have him sort of clearly stating that delivery is not going to go and then having to sort of clarify his remarks shortly thereafter. But it is just another example of something that we've seen time and again in this conflict, which is that the United States is clearly backing Ukraine and and is sort of providing quite a lot of the arsenal that the Ukrainian forces are using to repel Russia, while at the same time, the United States is trying to avoid getting directly involved in a conflict with Russia. And so there are all these blurry lines about what kinds of support would potentially risk a strong Russian escalation. And so it makes sense that President Biden is somewhat tiptoeing around these questions. We saw months ago the United States was considering sending jets to Poland, which would allow Poland to then send jets to Ukraine. We eventually decided not to do that when I think it probably would have been a wise thing to do. But you have to admit that the lines clearly are somewhat murky regarding what would be considered an act of direct U.S. involvement versus what would be considered mere support for the Ukrainian government and their war effort. And so that's kind of one of the root causes of this, all of these confusions and, and course reversals in terms of U.S. policy. Finally, we talked last week on a podcast about the reporting that President Biden has decided to forgive $10,000 per person in student loans for people under certain income thresholds. And I mentioned the argument that there are a lot of people in the United States who don't have degrees, plumbers, truck drivers. Are we really going to tax them to pay off student loans for people who may in five or 10 years be doctors and lawyers? And we got a couple of notes from listeners on this. Here's one from Hank in Florida. He says, I think there are a significant number of loans that are not federal government that are never mentioned in print or on podcasts. He adds, you never consider loans like Parent Plus or banks that college steered us to. Our extended family has both and would get no relief. A similar point made by Jay. He says, you never seem to consider or discuss, except only slightly in passing, the effect this is going to have on parents across the country who've planned and saved for college for their kids and have paid outright, as my wife and I have, for both our boys to attend university. He says that it would be highly motivating if Democrats are going to do this. I suspect there'll be a lot of people in suburbia like myself who are going to be really angry when this goes through. And Kim, it is a fair point. Maybe I need to do more at emphasizing it. We had a 
a letter from somebody a few months ago who said that he had taken out a second mortgage to help put his kids through school. And that's another example of somebody who would get no relief from Biden's plan and would have been better off, it turns out, taking out that student debt and waiting for the federal government to forgive some of it. Well, here is your very valid excuse, Kyle. You have younger children. I have no such excuse <laughs> because I actually have a, uh, a older children. In fact, the, the first one is going to be going to college next year. And the, the listeners make an incredibly valid point, something that's gone through my head many times and I should have addressed. I am in that same situation. I have saved diligently for all of my kids to go to college. And there's an extraordinary level of unfairness here, of differing treatment. We have talked a lot about the fact that these loans would largely go to pay off a lot of kids from wealthier circumstances, and you would get no such help for a lot of Americans who pay their way as they go and lower, and I should say, trade careers, etc. You've mentioned that. But yeah, there's also this element of extraordinary unfairness between those suburban parents who have since their kids were born, been using 529s or other elements of savings so that they can assist their kids and pay straight out as they go through school. Where is any nod or acknowledgement of their saving and sacrifice over the time versus parents who simply kind of sent their kids out and said, here, take a bunch of loans. And so this is why this is a political issue as well as a legal one. The legal question is obviously out there and is going to be addressed at some point by courts in terms of whether or not the president even has the authority to do something like this. But the political one is what the readers bring up, which is that if you choose a very benighted group of people who are going to get some kind of an enormous handout from the government and it strikes a lot of other Americans as unfair, there is a potential for a real political backlash. I'll cite one more line from this listener, Jay. He says, what about other options instead of loan forgiveness, say setting the interest rates for these loans to zero? and let the government fund the load processing. He says you could get on board for that kind of aid, but handouts, it sparks anger. And Monet, I think the issue there is that this is something President Biden has promised Democratic voters. He campaigned in 2020 on forgiving $10,000 in student loans per person. And so he now feels he needs to fulfill his campaign promise and try to placate the leftmost side of his party that wants him to go way above $10,000 in forgiveness to something more like $50,000. But Manet will give you the last word. I just think that the president and his advisors are underrating the salience, the political salience of this issue in the suburbs that won him the election in 2020, in the states like Michigan and Pennsylvania that won him the election in 2020. And if he goes through with this, I think there will be a lot more angry people than just these two listeners who wrote us. Right. And that political backlash really has already started to begin since Biden has been seriously floating the idea of student loan forgiveness within the past couple of months or so. I do think that he's sort of put himself in a tight squeeze because, as you said, he promised beginning with his campaign that he would outright forgive a certain amount of student debt. And it now seems like $10,000 is the amount that he has uh, zeroed in on. But there are quite a lot of other people who would not be beneficiaries of that forgiveness who would be very angered at the disparate treatment. And I frankly think that to the listener's point, yes, he could walk a more moderate path by zeroing out the interest instead of forgiving the loans outright. But that kind of hair splitting, I think, just sort of blunts the problem instead of getting rid of it. I think there are a lot of people who paid off their loans, including interest, who would say, hey, I could have used that a few thousand dollars or whatever their interest payments amounted to out of the share of their entire loan. So I don't think that that would really get rid of the political backlash at all. Thank you, Manet and Kim. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. And we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.